Hi, I'm Jim Alcon. I'm the editorial director of BookTrib.com, and today we're speaking with Marcus Harwood Jones. He's a writer, he's a visual artist, he's a documentary filmmaker who has just written two companion novels for teens, Romeo for Real and Just Julian. Happen to have them right here. Oh, so, <laughs> so does he. Look at that. How do you like that? Well, talk about uh, talk about uh, telepathy there. Um, so these books have been called modern LGBTQ retelling of Romeo and Juliet, um, both dealing with characters um, struggling with their identity and trying to come to terms with and understand their sexual orientations. So good morning, Marcus. Welcome. Glad you could be here. Um, so listen, um, now, I understand that, you know, when we talk about struggling with identity, struggling with coming to terms with sexual identity, um, you had your own personal struggles uh, growing up, just relating to gender identity and discovering who you are. And I guess to the point where you eventually had to make the decision, you know, to move up, move away from home. Um, tell us a little bit about your personal struggles growing up, you know, what you went through, how you dealt with it. Yeah, uh, it's certainly relevant to the novel since I actually started writing this work when uh, I was actually still a teenager and going through a lot of these. So when I uh, revisited the manuscript, I really saw a lot of fingerprints from my teenage self. Um, so yeah, when I was around, I mean, I'm not even sure how old I was, but uh, for, I knew for several years that I identified as transgender um and also that i was bisexual and it was very confusing how all these things happened at once and what i was going to do about it um and fortunately uh, i was not in a, a home situation where my family was very supportive about that we had other long-standing conflicts that were exacerbated by this issue um you know uh and eventually it, it came to a head and i was in uh, a streaming match with one of my parents and they just said, you know, if like if you're so unhappy here, you should just get out. So I could, I was like, okay, I will. And uh, I packed up a, a backpack of, of what I could carry and took off. Um, I knew uh, a girl from school who'd been kicked out um, when she got pregnant. So I went to where she lived. She had her own apartment. Um, and... Uh, I started writing these stories sort of in this place of feeling like I was losing my family, terrified of what was lying ahead, you know, I wasn't finished high school, um, and also feeling, you know, this, like, complicatedness, like, uh, my family very much had me believing that trans people were just unlovable, like, there was no love story for us, um, and so I just sort of started writing a love story about characters who could have a happier ending than the one I thought I was maybe going to get. Um, but the good news is we actually all get happy endings because um, even though it was quite difficult for a while, uh, I ended up being taken in by my grandparents um, and they supported me in finishing my high school degree. And then I moved up to Toronto where I met uh, the love of my life going to university and we currently live together. Um, and he's just constantly supporting me while I write my novels and, uh, and he's a, a technician in, in creative industry. So we kind of uh, build off each other a lot. So I feel like I, I also got my own happy ending. Well, you know, it, it, it must be difficult. Certainly going through all this at the age you went through, it's, I guess, encouraging to, to hear that your grandparents took you in, you know, even though, you know, your, your parents obviously, you know, were, were struggling themselves with this whole matter. But it sounds like, you know, when you talk about good news, there was also good news, um, you know, as you were growing up, because somewhere along the line, you acquired a love for storytelling. Um, and, and, yes. and you've talked about that, and, and, and you know, it sounds like it was a fundamental part of your upbringing. Um, talk a little bit about where this love for, for storytelling uh, came about. Yeah, you know, it might be ironic, I guess, but actually I think that my first love of storytelling came from my father and, and from my parents. Um, you know, even though we had a strange relationship, uh, I appreciate a lot that they did for me. And one of the things my father did growing up was read to me. Uh, he was an English major for his undergraduate degree. And uh, we read Tolkien and Brothers Graham and Harry Potter. And I got this huge love for these rich, imaginative worlds um, that I just started eating up all the time. And I became a very avid reader myself and started drawing comics and writing short stories. Um, and for years, and even now, when I have some downtime, one of my favorite things to do is just 
go into my head or open up a Word document and just start building a world. Um, uh, especially during the more difficult times in life, you know, when I was struggling with housing security or uh, not sure if I would complete my education, this kind of story building activity was a way to uh, sort of have a little retreat from all of that stuff and, and go into a place where the, you know, the, the plot points always were pointing towards a sort of narrative arc that could have uh, an ending that I had a, some control over. You know, so it was a bit of a coping mechanism, but also just a, a like a pleasurable pastime. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it wonderful how art can save the day, huh? You know, <laughs> no, I mean, whatever yeah. issues we're going through, you can always turn to, you know, some emotional outlet through, through art, which I know you do through painting as well. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds like you, you take a sort of gotten a good release out of being able to communicate, you know, through your, your painting as well. Yeah, absolutely. I love painting. I've uh, been a painter for uh, years and years now. Um, I mean, my favorite thing to do is work with watercolor paintings. Um, and I try to make art that's um, very fluid and alive. And uh, and I, I've been leaning towards um, incorporating affir affirming messages. And um, yeah, I, I just like, I love the way that I can just sort of go into uh, the painting zone Time feels like it just falls away, and um, I can spend hours and hours just uh, tracing lines and merging colors. It's it's a really therapeutic exercise. It sounds, it sounds very peaceful, I must tell you. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, look, turning to the books, I mean, survival has sounded like a, a central theme in, in your life, and, and actually I read somewhere where you said, you know, helping people survive is my activism. Um, so yeah. let's let, let's turn to the books, okay? Um, you know, Romeo for real, just Julian. Uh, how does the the theme of survival play out in those books? Absolutely. So I think both characters uh, are figuring out how they're going to survive in this world. You know, uh, Romeo, it's uh, more of an emotional survival. He's got you know on the surface it looks like he has it all. He's got uh, a good place on uh, on his basketball team. He's about to graduate high school. You know. He's got a nice home in, in the suburbs, but behind the closed doors, his parents, you know, are very neglectful, and he's having a hard time uh, being true to himself. He feels like when he's with his friends, he, he can't stay with Julie on his mind, um, and he's, he's sort of nursing this um, wound that he can't quite name. He kind of thinks maybe he needs a girlfriend, but of course, the novel shows that that's not quite what he's looking for. Um but uh, so for Romeo, it's sort of figuring out how is he going to survive in this world in a way that maybe feels more authentic. Because right now he feels very uh, repressed and he's starting to turn to drinking. And, and if he stayed, you know, I imagine if he stayed on that road, if he never met Julian, uh, he could probably have a pretty tough life a little later on. Um, on Julian's end, his, his survival is a little more um, material. You know, he lives with a, a single parent uh, in a, a less wealthy part of town. Um, he's been bullied so much that he's had to drop out of high school, and he's trying to figure out, uh, how, you know, can he literally keep living in this world because he's struggling so much with his mental health. Um, and so uh, he he really has a lot of trust issues, um, and he, the novel also discusses how he's uh, struggled with self-harm before as well and feeling isolated from some of his family. Um, so when he meets Romeo, it's really uh, an opportunity for him to learn to trust people again, and in doing so, um, be honest about his struggles, but also about how those skills actually taught him not only how to survive for himself, but how to take care of other people in a really unique way. Yeah, so they both kind of come into their own in a way that, um, that meets each other's needs on this struggle to survive authentically. What, what would you say are some of the other key themes in the book besides survival? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, other key themes in the book probably would include, um, like, I mean, obviously it's a love story, romance is a big theme, but also I would describe a lot of, like, friendship and uh, even potentially found family. Um, I think that both Romeo and Julian, while they have uh, different relationships with their parents, um, they both are they're struggling to get a little bit of distance and, and a little bit of independence. And so um, there's lots of characters in the book who sort of, who could play different types of uh, uh, relatable roles. You know, Julian has like a whole network of friends who he's trying to get back in touch with and they 
also to step in and show him that they're there for him even when he's struggling. Um, and for Romeo, uh, he has to confront these sort of fake friends and find out who is real and who's going to stand by him. Um, and, you know, he finds some people will walk away when you tell them the truth, but also some people will get closer to you and tell you their truth in response. Well, you know, so it's... I was just going to say, so it is a love story between these two boys, but also they have their own complicated networks of uh, support and care. You know, when you talk about the, the networks of support and care, you know, that there was a point in Romeo for real when the main character, Romeo, you know, when he, he's just dabbling with his first homosexual encounter, and, and he says kind of to himself, you know, um, I, I just kissed a boy, you know, and, and I liked it. <laughs> um, this is, you know, it seems like sort of a, a moment of self-discovery where you, you kind of like, you know, feeling like a, a, a piece of a puzzle is, is coming together. But the next step, of course, is he, he needs to sort out those feelings a bit. And he's considering, you know, I, I need to talk to somebody. And, and obviously he has close friends in the book that he can um, you know, rely on. Yet he's also weighing the consequences. You know, do I really want to open up at this point and, and how do I communicate this and what might, you know, what might happen if I do? Talk a little bit about that dilemma that Romeo faces. I guess just the dilemma in, in general when something like this occurs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I wrote, it's kind of funny, I wrote Romeo and Julian uh, a little bit as, as, as two sides of a, of a coin. Um, Julian, obviously, is a character who, he, his, his mom is out, he's been out pretty much his whole life, you know, that's not really a worry for him. His problems, he's sort of like, yeah, it's not really a big, big deal to me. But for Romeo, this is like the big deal of his story. Um, and that's sort of like, should I tell somebody and risk the news getting out, risk this being a little bit more real, or should I try to keep it bottled up for a little longer? I mean, I think that's going to be relatable for a lot of, especially younger readers who are, are just sort of trying to understand themselves. It's especially confusing, too, because once you tell someone, there's sort of this rush to put a label on it and say, okay, well, um, it was a one-off thing, or I'm totally gay, and, it, you know, it gets very confusing quickly if, if you're not as sure. Um, which is something that I could identify with growing up. I, I was like, I think I have crushes on everybody. <laughs> you don't know what to do about it. Um, and so for Romeo, you know, his his sort of internal struggle, it's a, it's a question of self-acceptance and, and also the risks of his social standing and, and this identity he's felt for years. You know, even though it's not authentic, he's invested in it. Um, so yeah, when he turns to people he, he trusts and he, he opens up about this, it becomes a little bit more real every time. And you see near to the end of the book, he actually chooses that because he wants it to be real, because he wants uh, his relationship with Julian to be real. And, you know, it's sort of a step of saying, no, that this isn't just because I feel pressured to, to you know, tell this to somebody. It's because I want to, and I want to own it as part of who I am. You, you mentioned that, you know, the, the, that somebody, you saw a team reading this, and, and depending on sort of where they are in I don't know if this is a process or just a situation, but however you want to define it. But who, who did you, as you were writing these books, what, what was your target audience and who did you see as, as the people that were going to get the most out of this? Yeah. I mean, I definitely wrote this book a little bit for my younger self, for my you know, 17 year old self who was, you know, freshly out of my parents' house, hanging out at the LGBTQ center, desperately looking on this like tiny bookshelf of reading material saying, you know, is there a story here that I can relate to? Um, I'm definitely writing it, I mean, largely for uh, a teen demographic, although I think anybody of any age can enjoy these stories. Um, but I'm writing it for characters around the age of, of these two and, and they're about their last year of high school. Um, and I'm writing for that demographic because I find that's an age where a lot of kids are starting to you get in a little bit more serious relationships, think about going out on their own. Uh, many kids have started to question their gender or sexuality or started to put words to it. And so I wanted to show a story that was uh, gave some complexity to those narratives. I think sometimes we get sort of a, a single story about coming out. You, you do it once and then it's done forever. Um, but in reality, people are always growing and changing. And it's also, there's a lot of options. Uh, there's not just straight and gay in this world. So I wanted to show characters who, who spoke to that complexity, which is why there's lots of different types of trans people in the book. There's lots of different types of people. You know, Julian himself says, I don't necessarily identify as gay. I just am me. Like, I don't need a label, which is 
Romeo, who is very attached to that label because it helps him articulate uh, who he is to people who don't understand. So I wanted to show, show that complicatedness, especially to um, to the teen demographic. Got it. So t- tell me about the, um, the the inspiration behind the Romeo and Julio, Juliet connection. Where's that from? I mean, I know where it's from, but but tell me from your point of view. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's pretty cheesy, um, but I definitely, like I mentioned, I actually started writing this manuscript ages when I was 17 myself. Um, and I was listening to the radio, and there was a song, I'm pretty sure by Taylor Swift, where the lyrics were, uh, Daddy says, stay away from Julian. And of course, she's a woman singing about a man, and she's sort of just doing a gender reversal, but it got me to thinking, and I was like, yeah, like, what would it be like if Julian was a guy and it was a gay love story? Like, how would that change it? Um, and I don't know, was, uh, at the time, I think it was just one of my many, like, little fantas- fantastical retreats. Mm-hmm. But the more I thought about it, the more I got intrigued by this world and thinking, okay, well, if Romeo and Julian are these characters, who would be Tybalt? And uh, who would be the Duke? And, you know, uh, who would be Benvolio? And uh, all these all these characters, Mercutio, um, Rosalie, uh, the nurse, I just started um, sort of bringing them into a more modern turn. And when you look in the book, um, almost all of them do show up. You know, we have Friar Lawrence turn into a high school counselor, or um, the the nurse character becomes Julian's mom, um, and she's a, a nurse, she's a night nurse. She, she's a, a nurse in the emergency room at the hospital, right? And uh, Benvolio and, and Mercutio become Ben and Marty, Romeo's best friends. Um, and she both becomes Ty. And I could go on and on, but... Um, so I love sort of reinventing these characters and, and building up this little... Um, sort of modern twist. Um, so by the time I, I got to writing, I felt like these characters already had some life in them, and building the world around them, I just figured, why not put them in Winnipeg? That's where I grew up. It, it would have been funny if, th- think about this, I don't know that enough people could have figured this out, um, if you didn't call the books, you know, with the titles of Romeo and, and Julian, and still played off of Romeo and Juliet and had characters within each book that represented a character in Romeo and Juliet so that somebody would come to the revelation on their own and say, wait a minute, this has a surprising likeness to something else I know. But that, that's, that's asking too much, I think, of <laughs> your readers. Well, maybe, maybe for my next book. I think for these ones, we wanted it loud and saying, check it out, we made Romeo and Juliet, and that's amazing. But maybe next time I'll do like uh, a fist on Hamlet or something, and I'll just keep it settled. <laughs> so, can, can we we talk about one of your past works? I, I saw that you had a title, "Confessions of a Teenage Transsexual Whore," and, mm-hmm. and if ever they're going to have if they're ever going to have a TV a made for TV movie that's going to get somebody's attention, that's the title. Um, tell me a little <laughs> bit about what the what inspired that and why you wrote that and the story behind it. Sure. Yeah. So that is probably my most provocative title. Um, so up until this point, um, I've largely been writing uh, chat books, um, short short stories, nonfiction, and pairing them with visual art. Um, and uh, that collection is actually the first of, of that genre for me. Um, it's a ten part zine series, which means uh, each book is, is you know uh, relatively short, usually about five short stories, five original pieces of art. Um, and I, I wrote that series during the years when I was uh, living on my own in, in Toronto and, and kind of like ends me. There's about two years there where I wasn't in university. I wasn't close to my grandparents. Uh, like, you know, we were emotionally supported, but physically I was far away from them. I couldn't live with them. Um, and I was starting to kind of work. Uh, so I ended up doing sex work uh, to, to pay the bills, which a lot of young people do, a lot of young trans people do. Um, and I have no shame about that. It's, I think of it as just another profession. Um, and, and that was my work for about two years, meeting with clients, going to dinners, going to hotels, whatever. Um, but, you know, it was kind of hard. I was seeing mostly older clients. I was a pretty young person. I had all this childhood trauma to work out. So the way I sort of dealt with it was after I met with someone, I'd come home. Um, and, and I've always journaled. I've always been a very careful journal keeper. So I started typing up my, uh, my meetings with clients and, and telling them as stories. And that way it sort of... That wasn't necessarily something that had happened to me. It was something that was happening to my character. And it was going to be part of this character's narrative arc. Um, and I sort of built, you know, my coping mechanism, clearly, uh, these short stories where I would, I'd call them, you know, pseudonyms like 
uh, I think one of the, the most interesting ones I called him the collector because when I went to his house, he had a huge collection of bean babies that was like all over his living room and shelves. And I was like, okay, this is who you are. Got it. Noted. That in the book. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd meet with people like this. Some of them were really nice. Some of them were less nice. But whatever the case, um, got their own story. They got a, little, a picture. And uh, eventually, years after it was all done, I said, you know what? I'm just going to release these stories. Because I bet you there's a lot of other young people who are in the same position who feel like I did. Like, nobody would understand. This has to be a big secret. Um, so I gave it the most scandalous title I could think of, as eye-catching as I could think of, so that if there's another person who's in that same position, they'll see it and they'll go, oh my gosh, I'm actually not alone. And yeah, so, I, you know, I, I put a little bit of risk out there by owning those stories, but also um, it was healing for me, and I think now it hopefully heals some other people. Well, you know, as, as you say, it was therapeutic for you, but also I, I think what what readers of you have to understand is these are real life situations that you have lived and gone through and obviously reflected in the work and, and the way you're you're seeing you know the characters that you portray and that's you know it has to be a, a strong strong influence um speaking of influences who would you say are the biggest influences or inspirations in your life and, and certainly in your literary life hey yeah um well let's see i mean I, I've, I've always been drawn to high fantasy and science fiction. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not writing it yet, but I hope to one day find my way up there. Um, so, you know, some of my, my favorite books. Um, well, okay, I will start with one that is probably a, a bit cheesy, but my grandfather wrote a book um, called Where All You Love. Um, he self-published it in his 60s. So it's the only book he's written so far, but I adore it. I think it's a beautiful mystery novel about a, a, a retired lawyer who teams up with a jewelry, jewelry thief. It's totally not my genre, but um, I love to see his world building. I think especially because we're related and I actually see some similarities in the way we do description or the way that we build story and build, build characters. So it's always funny to, to wonder how much of that is my life experience, how much is my genetics. Um, uh, so that's that's a big one. I've also been, uh, I'm just going to glance at my bookshelf. I mean, I've always been a fan of supporting other transgender authors. So uh, I grew up reading, you know, Kate Borenstein, for example. Um, I've been reading some Vivian Namaste. These are more academic works. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I loved Kurt Vonnegut when I was, when I was uh, about the age of started writing these, these novels. Um, Slaughterhouse-Five blew my mind. I love the, the, incredible storytelling capacity he has to jump through all these time periods and, and really pull you along so fluidly that, uh, you know, I think that can, that writing stuff can very quickly become disjointed and confusing. But when I read it, I just felt just like I was there for every single scene. And I loved it. I would love to watch some Kurt Vonnegut movies one day if somebody would make them. Um, it's funny. I, I haven't thought about Kurt Vonnegut in, in ages. In college, I, I, I read every one of them. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I know, I, I was, a wonderful collection of his work. Uh, he's he's a big. I'm I'm a big fan. Um, and my, the newest one on my bookshelf right now is called uh, All Inclusive uh, by Farzana Doctor. I saw her at um, a, a book festival last year called Naked Heart, and it's uh, a story, a fiction story about a woman who works at a resort. Um, and she has affairs with uh, the different tourists, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's sort of just like, you know, her love life, some drama, it feels um, uh, a little bit like some Sex in the City vibes, like it's funny and it's sexy, but then also there's some, you know, real conversations about, like, what does it mean to, like, work at a resort? How do people misunderstand you or just see you as, like, part of the furniture? Um, and, and the more it goes into the book, the more it gets, uh, complicated, you know, people start finding out she's hooking up with guests, it becomes very dramatic. Um, and also she, uh, ends up reconnecting with the father. So it's a, it's an emotional roller coaster. I'm still working through it, but I'm really excited to see how it ends. Terrific. So we're, we're winding down. So I'm wondering just, do you have any parting advice that you could share that you haven't already because you've shared plenty just for young adults? struggling to discover who they are and understanding their sexual orientation and trying to be comfortable with it. What, what could you offer them? Yeah. I mean, I, 
I would offer them that, uh, you know, firstly, it's okay to be who they are. There's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing broken about them. Even if they're different than the people around them, that doesn't mean that they're bad. Um, and, you know, my advice would be find out the way to tell your story and tell it. You know, it can be to your journal. It can be to a friend. It can be to a counselor. Uh, it can just be to your pillow, but like, don't, don't keep a cage stuck inside you because uh, that's just going to make it hurt more. And eventually it's going to want to come out one way or another. So, uh, you know, maybe you can decide how to do that. And I think once you find the ways that we tell our stories, um, life gets a lot easier. Okay. Well, once again, the books are Romeo for real. Uh, just Julian, the, the writer is Marcus Harwood Jones. Uh, we've spent uh, uh, some time here with some fascinating insights. Uh, you've got a, a great life story to, to talk about, and you've shared some storytelling in the, these two fine books. So thanks for being with us. Uh, it's been enjoyable and, and very enlightening. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it.